Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, where we are going to explore one of the biggest problems facing AI and ML initiatives, the exploratory data analysis problem. Just a couple notes before we get started here. Uh, we will have time for Q&A at the end. This should be about 40 minutes of content, so we'll try to get to as many questions as we can at the end of that. Feel free to enter them into the chat at any time. And this webinar will be available on demand uh, as soon as we're done today. So if you enjoy the content, please share with your colleagues. And now to introduce today's speaker. Today, we are joined by Henry Lee, who is a senior data scientist at Big Eye. Henry has a wealth of experience with data quality issues, uh, both in academia and in industry. He was formerly a data scientist uh, on the intelligent decision systems team at Uber, where he led the development of Uber's data monitor. With that, I will hand things over to Henry to get started. Thanks, Nolan. Hi, everyone. In this webinar, we'll be talking about one of the major reasons behind artificial intelligence and machine learning pipeline failures. And that is, we do not do enough exploratory data analysis until a problem arises. Once built, the ML pipeline is expected to work all the time without manual intervention. This is a goal, not a given. So there's a misconception regarding what needs to be built and maintained over time. We will go over a case study that is based on a set of real data quality incidents. This is a little bit unusual for a webinar, but we think that the best way to convey the nature of data quality problems is through an example model after true stories. In my experience, I think you can only get better with data quality monitoring by actually doing the work, responding to data incidents to see what the actual pain points are. Reading about data quality monitoring or experiencing it from a non-technical perspective is great, though there's a lot to it on the uh, technical side of things. We'll then talk a little bit about our work building the next generation of data quality monitors at AI. This really and at first helped significantly by our customers as we develop reliable features for the app they like. It's one thing to develop a data monitoring theory, but it's another to build a system that works for the real world in many different business across different industries. For this, I want to thank our customers for their instrumental feedback over the last year. And finally, we will have a Q&A session. As Nolan said, if you have any questions at any time, please feel free to write them down in the chat and we'll get to them. If you're watching this recording, please feel free to send us questions by email or LinkedIn if you don't see your questions addressed. Now let's get started. One could argue that the ultimate goal of having data in a business is to help the business make decisions to grow and make profits more effectively. Amassing a large amount of data without a way to turn that into financial gain is wasteful. In the case of big data, the cost could be enormous. Every company goes through a data maturation process in which it hires employees to gather and make use of data. Some of you might be familiar with the Dell model of data management, and it describes this process in four stages. Uh, it, it basically says that a company or a team will start out being data aware. Then they progress, progress to proficient, to data driven, and then finally data savvy. As your company thinks about a business problem, it will start gathering data to begin the project or that business itself. So a quote from the data aware stage could be, gosh, it's taking forever to read through all the documents. Let's hire someone to pull all of the data that we have from PDFs and enter them into Excel sheets. So in the data aware stage, everything is manual. And as the company goes through the next stage, the data provision stage, it will establish a set of 
KPIs or key performance indicators, and it might have data dashboards, uh, dashboards showing uh, KPIs and or other business measures uh, that will help the company to track its performance over time. And it's extremely useful for some bus business decisions. Um, as the company progresses to data-driven and data savvy stages, uh, that's where uh, the data that it collects become an integral pro uh, parts of its decision-making process. Um, a typical quote from the data savvy stage could be, in the past month, since the rollout of our automated refund bots, we have reduced customer complaints by 10%, and our business has seen a 20% increase in customer satisfaction. How do we get more customers on board and maintain or even improve this user experience? So in this stage, a lot of the processes are gonna be scalable because of data and data processes. And, and here uh, in this model, uh, it says that the data provision stage uh, changing to the data driven stage is the hardest part for a business uh, in its growth. And AI and ML have a lot of promises uh, saying that they will help businesses to scale fast, to move from having dashboards to data driven processes that do not need manual maintenance so that you can hire the same amount of people doing a lot more for your business because of these uh, initiatives. So AI and ML, they provide a lot of promises uh, in dealing with the complex nature of the real world. And companies have rushed to take advantage of them to supercharge their business. Um, according to a survey of about 1,000 executives uh, in tech, nearly 92% thought that companies should lean on AI to improve their decision-making processes. And in the year 2020 alone, more than $50 billion were invested in the space. And the investment numbers projected to be more than $110 billion by the year 2024. So it's a lot of money uh, invested in the space. And yet we know that most of these initiatives fail. Why is that? Well, uh, it's very complicated, but 87% of data professionals peg data quality issues as the main reason that their organizations fail to successfully implement AI and ML. And dissecting this a little bit more, uh, organizations estimated that the average cost of having poor data quality is about $13 million per year. While this may be the average out there, I have seen figures that are much higher. And I think it just depends on the size of the company and how ambitious they are with uh, their data. Organizations usually don't know their full data-driven potential because they do not address their bad data issues. So um, why data quality issues? Um, how do these issues arise uh, in the AI and ML initiatives? Let's dissect this further. According to an Anaconda survey from the year 2020, uh, data pro uh, practitioners show that they understand the importance of data quality checks, processing, and visualization. Data management is overall a very time consuming process across the data science world. Uh, notice that the training part of this work accounts for only 12% of the, uh, of the data work, while the deployment process takes about 11% of the work. Now, that leaves the majority of the work, um, over 60%, to data processing visualization um, and 
cleaning, right? So, uh, so it's very straightforward to know that if the data work is not done properly uh, at the very beginning, then you will have bad data feeding into your models downstream, uh, which will then contribute to the failures of your AI and ML initiatives. On the right-hand side here, uh, we're referencing a study done by Google where they have found that internally uh, addressing data quality issues is a key uh, is the key to high state automations in its businesses. While many practitioners are highly aware of the issues, there is a prevalence of messy data and opaque data pipelines. Uh, now, we, um, our uh, data professionals, we're all data professionals to some extent. We have all experienced this and it's a fact of life. However, there are many ways we can manage the risks of having poor quality data. Understanding how the data work is done, uh, how the data work is done is very crucial. And we will talk about this um, and also how data quality monitoring can help automate some of the tedious work. Uh, to get us to a better state with our AI and ML initiatives. A famous statistician, John Tsuki, once said that the greatest value of a picture is when it forces us to notice what we never expect to see. To ensure that your data values are good and fit for use, you must perform exploratory data analysis. You need to interrogate the data you're working with by asking some basic questions that statisticians have been teaching for more than 100 years. Are there enough data points? Are the measures of centers and spreads similar to what was expected? How many data points are good and actually usable for analysis? Are there any missing values, bad values? And are these corrupted data points a significant part of your data? In addition, are there any outliers? And if so, how will you handle these outliers? Dealing with outliers is actually really tricky because it's not only a probability-based exercise. You would also need to know the full ex uh, context of your problem, including domain knowledge in the field you're working in so that you can apply the most appropriate model. In short, EDA is one of the first steps to successful AI and ML initiatives. Before you even start thinking about algorithms, you need to understand the data. What happens in this phase will determine the course of the automation that takes place downstream. When done correctly, EDA will help you identify unwanted patterns and noise and corrupted data values before they make their way into the downstream uh, models. And it will be best if you can do this for all batches of data. So not only for the first batch where you develop your ML model, but you need to continuously checking your data as they feed into your model. Um, and that's where the problem com uh, comes in. Data scientists are bogged down by huge volumes of data in increasingly dynamic environments without the tools to effectively explore their data. And as a result, Shifting patterns in the data can erode even the highest performing pipelines. So the goal here is to develop tools that will help automate most of this tedious process for data scientists and other stakeholders like data engineers, data analysts. And automated data quality monitoring is one of the necessary tools to achieve this. Now, before leaving this uh, first section of the webinar, I want to talk a little bit about reacting to data changes. This might be obvious to some of you in the audience, but data changes can occur in many ways. Data exploration can help you gain insights into your data pipeline health, as well as your business dynamics. This allows your business, uh, your company to develop additional tools and processes to react appropriately to any change detected. Sometimes it takes a while to understand the problem at hand to know whether it's a part of data pipeline issue or business dynamics. 
We'll see an example of this in the case study. Regardless, you need to spot the anomaly or change based on EDA um, with your metrics history. If it's a business change, you may want to retrain your model or develop a better uh, model that's more appropriate to uh, your business with the latest information. If it's a pipeline issue, also known as a data incident, then you need to work with data engineers and other stakeholders to troubleshoot. In the near future, intelligent logics in the data quality monitor will help data consumers to identify these categories of change more effectively. Before we start the case study, um, just a reminder that if you have any question, please write them in the chat and we'll address them in the Q&A session. Um, this case study is based on true stories. We're gonna be looking at this company called Meme Shirts. It's an international company that sells printed memes on t-shirts. Very simple. In the printed logo t-shirt industry, it is smart to write with the viral wave as demand for a popular meme can crash very quickly, making the shirts that you have made worthless. If the shirts aren't sold, they require storage space at warehouses and these storage costs um, won't make sense at some point. And so the company will have to uh, be forced to get rid of the unwanted surplus. Thus, it is super important to have a streamlined meme mining, manufacturing, and storage process for the t-shirts to sell all inventory. Imagine you're a data scientist working at meme shirts. To scale the company's operations and increase profitability dramatically, you helped launch an automation service for making new t-shirts. Your service is responsible for mining the demand for a particular t-shirt design to create automatic orders that can be filled to print a meme in the form of text or image on blank t-shirts. The service has helped the company write the meme viral trends by making the appropriate numbers of meme t-shirts at the right time. For the past seven months, it has helped increase revenue by 20% while lowering warehouse storage costs by 30%. It's a big deal. During the 2020 pandemic, we have perfected the process for meme popularity mining. You can now monitor long-term memes as well as discovering uh, new short-term memes that can be very explosive um, and they can be called overnight sensations. Now let's go over a couple examples. And I think uh, you might know this. Um, first, on real is an older meme that gained more traction during 2020 as people like the idea that birds are government drones spying on us. It has a meme fan base with very elaborate conspiracy theories and that contributed to its longevity through the years. Cat lawyer meme, on the other hand, is a short-term meme, um, but it was super viral. If you have seen it, please go check it out because it's hilarious. It comes from a Zoom session in which a lawyer had a kitten filter on. One of the phrases we got from this meme is the quotes, I'm here live, I'm not a cat. From the trend analysis, this is a scenario in which money needs to be made now. The demand is very spiky. So what's behind your service? What is the magic behind this meme popularity money process? Here is the model that you came up with after months of work on the data uh, about uh, a project that began about a year ago. Uh, it's very simple. 
it basically says that the man for the mean equals to several terms uh, and they depend on the social media velocity, um, how popular it is right now, how fast it's moving, and last month's sale for that particular means t-shirts. Um, and so <clears throat> if you're marketing this, you can say that this is a very sophisticated AI or ML model. Anyways, on February 10th, your service determined that I'm here live, I'm not cats, is a very popular meme. And it's so popular that you need to order 10,000 t-shirts. So 10,000 t-shirts um, were ordered for this particular meme. A month has passed since the orders were made on February 10th. Now in March, only 40% of the t-shirts were sold, leaving a surplus inventory of, of 6,000 shirts. Usually, shirts are 90% sold a month later. Now we have a problem of surplus, which can dramatically increase the storage cost at the warehouses across the world. Now let's take some time to think about what are the actions that you would take next. A, check the data in a data table serving values to your service. B, alerts the data engineering team so they can check that the data pipeline is working as expected. C, looking at the performance dashboard, drill down to look at whether this incidence is isolated for cat lawyer or whether this may be a larger issue for other memes as well or D, all of the above. I'm gonna give you 30 seconds to pause and think about this. Okay, if you chose D, all of the above, you're correct. When there's a problem, it's always not obvious what the underlying root cause is. So you want to um, start exploring what's going on and you have to communicate that there's a problem to your stakeholders or, uh, or teams uh, that might be affected by the problem you're seeing. So you alerted the data engineering team, and as an experienced data scientist, you try to answer the following questions. Is my service ingesting the cor uh, correct data? Is the schema of the data matching what's expected? Are there enough data points? Are there missing values? Are there bad values as of the expected range? Are there extreme outliers? Are the averages and certain deviations of the data similar to what they were last month, two months ago, when there was no problem. So we have spent some time on this and an hour later, you saw that everything's fine. Uh, the values check out that there is no uh, null values. There's no uh, bad values. However, when you looked at the averages, you, uh, you observe that the values have increased a little bit over the last month. Not extremely, but they have increased a little bit. So then you, you're, uh, you go back to your model and you see how that could affect uh, the final value, uh, the current demand for, uh, for the mean. And you see that the increased values uh, could increase the velocity term here, leading to uh, you um, ordering more t-shirts. So that could be a problem. And, and then you go to the dashboard where you monitor performance 
to see if the surplus problems happening to only cat lawyer or whether it's happening to other uh, memes as well. And you observe that a small portion of other memes are affected uh, as their surpluses are, uh, are more than expected in this month. Now, this may be a data issue or it could be a business issue. Because um, you're thinking, well, the demand pattern is a peak now. Now you can observe that the demand um, could make sense here because there is a huge peak um, for the popularity of the meme uh, over time. But you didn't know about this when the orders were made at the very beginning. So perhaps the world has changed so that uh, your model no longer works optimally. Which of the following actions will you take now? A, ping the data engineering team with your findings. B, the world might have changed as discussed. So you need to come up with a better model for the demand. C, wait and do nothing because sometimes doing nothing is better than doing something. Or D, A and B. Let's take 30 seconds to think through this. Okay, let's use the process of, of elimination. C, when and do nothing is not good here because you do have new information. If you chose B, that the world has changed and you need to come up with a new model, um, you might be right, but at this point in time, you don't know for sure. There is very little evidence showing that uh, this is indeed the case. Um, and A is the right answer here because with new information, you want to communicate that to teams that could be um, helping you or teams that will get affected by this problem as well. So you go with A, you, you ping the data engineer with your new findings and you are uh, gonna keep um, analyzing the data and brainstorm what's gonna, uh, what could happen to the service that's making it to generate uh, surpluses. An hour later, the data engineering team responds to your request. They have read your messages and they tell you that three upstream tables, upstream of the data tables that you're responsible for, also have larger average values. Uh, based on the comparison to the values uh, from those tables two months ago. So it, it's the same thing as what you have noted earlier for your tables. And, um, and there also appears to be no changes to the data tables themselves. So it's really the values. And, and they decided uh, they wanted to do more exploring to see what's going on. Another two hours later, uh, the data engineers gets back to you again, and she says she finds that the larger values started at the beginning of February and coincides with the infrastructure team's efforts to scale the computing infrastructure. In this case, uh, leadership said there is a new freshness, data freshness SLA to be met, and you have to do something to make sure that all the mean mining uh, jobs are done by certain time during the day. There are some memes that cannot be uh, fit. All the memes, because you're monitoring the entire world for memes. Um, so it gets very difficult to meet the SLA. So the infrastructure team thought that they could uh, increase the number of mean miners and let the idle miners to work on memes that haven't had their results generated for that day. 
but the team did not put in place a process to prevent duplicates um, to be generated. Uh, and some memes have very long running times due to fluctuations in the world. And during uh, that time, that running time, additional jobs were created for these memes. Uh, even though the first job uh, did not hang and it actually completes at the end. And as a result, you have duplicated result, uh, outcomes results uh, saved in the downstream tables and they are all aggregated together and that aggregation gets propagated throughout this 20 miles worth the pipeline before reaching you, the service owner, for the automation uh, of t-shirt design. Um, so now we have strong evidence that we may have a data incidence. But we are not entirely sure yet, right? It's all about generating enough evidence uh, to see what the root cause is. Now, with this information, which of the following actions will you take? A, put in place a dedupe process based on unique meme IDs. B, roll back the infrastructure change. C, talk to the engineer that's responsible for computing resource and ask what is the best step to take. Or D, ask the VP of engineering what to do. Let's take 30 seconds for this. All right, so there is no time to waste here. Uh, once you know that um, that there is a problem uh, or you have a root cause candidate that's uh, backed by strong evidence, you want to tackle that as soon as possible to mitigate the problem. So you want to put in place a detailed process uh, to see if that resolves your problem. Rolling by the infrastructure change is not feasible because this uh, has been going on for a month now. And a lot of processes downstream may be dependent on this change, uh, at least the features that it enables. Uh, talking to the engineer responsible for this um, is not a good resolution step, uh, though it might be nice to contact them eventually. They could be on vacation or they might not uh, know enough about your service because you're sitting more than 20 miles away from this pipeline, the initial pipeline. Uh, D, asking the VP of engineering may not lead you anywhere. Uh, they might be slow to respond uh, because they're very busy and they may not have any context of what's going on at the moment. So you and the data engineer both agree that uh, the best action to take is to dedupe um, the data at the very beginning of the data pipeline. And on top of that, you decided to spend the rest of the day to pick out memes that have uh, surpluses that are higher than expected. So then you can alert uh, the operations team to stop making new t-shirts for those memes uh, to, uh, to make sure that you can control uh, the storage cost at the warehouses. You monitor this, um, this problem for another month, for one month after this uh, D2 process is put in place, and you observe that uh, the inventory surpluses have gone down uh, to normal levels for all t-shirts. So with this behind you, what should a company do going forward? A, write up and maintain a postmortem detailing the root cause and how you resolve the issue. B, put in place dynamic table monitoring so that any change 
different than history will be uh, will set off an alert. C communicates change even if it seems irrelevant or minor, widely across all teams within the company, or D all of the above. Now this is easy. We don't have to take thirty seconds for this. Um, the answer is D all of the above. You need to um, you need to document everything very well, especially um, a problem that affected your your business operations. Um, it's really good to put in uh, dynamic table monitoring so you can capture uh, small changes um, that might be very relevant to the success of your business. Um, and in this case, the success of your ML processes. Um, and they also give you a way to uh, supercharge your EDA as you are uh, wondering what could have gone wrong that led to uh, this problem that I'm seeing right now. Because when you're dealing with a business problem uh, or a data problem, you don't know, right? You don't know which one is affecting you. So having uh, the EDA numbers generated already could help you uh, to troubleshoot a problem maybe within an hour instead of taking half the day or even a day to root cause. And finally, uh, you have done this very well here. You communicated the problem, uh, but uh, any change needs to be communicated and documented. Um, you as a data scientist, you did not know about this infrastructure change, right? Um, so the, the best approach here is to prevent uh, that from happening. You need to communicate. Uh, if you're a data engineer, you have to communicate your change to data scientists because uh, we do not know, uh, usually we're gonna know what's happening to the infrastructure. And uh, I also wanna highlight that this, this example um, is, uh, is giving us uh, this, this look into what we call a slow degradation um, incident that is not very obvious when there's a problem, uh, when we think about data quality issues, we, we tend to think, oh, there is a duplication, there is a missing value problem. But a lot of data incident problems out there are coming from this slow degradation process. Uh, you do not observe the problem until weeks later, months later. And it's very difficult to root cause because uh, then you have to go back to all the changes to understand which one could be your uh, your causal uh, or your problem candidates and then you have to then work with um, a lot of stakeholders to pinpoint the actual issue and how to mitigate the problem so that example basically basically uh, shows you uh, how data incident mitigation, um, how it takes place uh, at the workplace uh, in the tech company. Usually that's the process. Um, and EDA is done when a problem arises. So why is that? Why do we not do it all the time? Um, and I'm giving you a non-exhaustive list of reasons here. Uh, usually tests are put in place. Uh, engineers love tests. And the problem with tests is that uh, at least the way that we're doing tests today uh, as a community is that data changes over time as your business changes. So everything is very dynamic. And that means you have to update your tests continuously. And this process is not scalable as the data pipeline becomes more convoluted and more complex and longer throughout time. Hiring more data scientists is not the answer here uh, because data scientists, they're just, you know, when you hire one data scientist, there's that one person and they cannot really do, you know, two people's work, 100 people's work. They're still just doing one person's work. And frankly, that work is very time consuming and not fun at all. I have uh, heard from colleagues that 
uh, who are monitoring data, table health, uh, they said to me, uh, I'm monitoring 50 tables and this has gone on for weeks. I really don't like my job right now. I want to do something else. This is not fun and not challenging and just takes so much of my time. Um, and people complain about the data sometimes. So as someone who's monitoring these data tables, you have to go in, um, make sure that they're happy. Um, another reason is that ED has always been manual and it's done on one data match at a time. Um, so traditionally that's done this way and I'm thinking, well, why not do this automatically? Because we can do that. We can build tools to, to make this automated. So uh, we can let the machines do the heavy lifting. And that will reduce the manual toil of EDA and help companies to establish uh, a company-wide data management process. And that leads us to the uh, final session here of how we are building the next generation of data monitors at Big Map. As mentioned earlier, anomaly detection is tricky because you need to know the domain knowledge um, as well as the context of the problem. Uh, from experience uh, monitoring uh, data, I have seen that if you were just to generate individual data metrics, they tend to be noisy. And, and so uh, the common approach is to generate a lot of data metrics and hope that some of these will help you uh, identify a problem and when it arises. And there's a lot of different filtering steps that's put in place, such as generating anomaly scores uh, and similar techniques to, um, to reduce the number of false positives that you're getting from these um, monitoring processes. Um, and that does not solve the fundamental problem, which is how do you uh, create a good anomaly potential model? Right, so at Big Out, we work really hard at this problem um, because your metrics could come in different flavors. Uh, they could be wiggling through time or they can be flat. And in each scenario, depending on the data metric that you're monitoring, the anomaly model needs to be built differently. There is no one size fits all solution to this. Um, so we work hard to make sure that the boundaries that we set automatically are, are good and won't generate too many false positives over time. Another problem that we need to tackle is coverage. What are the data metrics that you need to set up in order for you to capture data incidents um, and enable the company to do EDA very efficiently so they know that something is a data problem and not a business problem, right? So over here, uh, I'm showing a screenshot of a data incident that was captured by Big Eye. Um, so for this particular uh, data table, uh, now we're looking at five data metrics, the min carnality, personnel, max, and kurtosis. Uh, here, you can see that the boundaries for max, null, and carnality um, have not been breached. And so you will not see alerts from these uh, in, in this past history when the uh, when it is not happen here. However, for the kurtosis and the uh, men, you, you will see that things have changed uh, dramatically. Uh, for kurtosis, it's a uh, steady state shifts from up to down here. And, and so this gives you evidence that your data has changed. And in this particular case, it's the distribution of data. Um, so it's very likely that it's a data incident. So uh, here we're, uh, we're showing two different problems that we need to solve. One is having a good set of anomaly detection models generated automatically. 
and then to having enough coverage so we can be sensitive to data incidents. All in all, we're taking an engineering approach to data quality monitoring, and we think that this will help uh, with exploratory data analysis significantly, which in turn will help our customers uh, to do better AI and ML that will lead to their success. Um, That's great, Henry. Let me just get to, sorry, folks, skip to the wrong slide. Let me just get to the Q&A slide here. So Henry, um, thanks for the presentation. That was excellent. Um, we've got a couple of questions uh, from the attendees. Uh, so let me start here. Um, as, a, as a data science I, I think specifically from your POV is what they're asking. Um, are there problems that you deal with that uh, other people in the company would know about? Um, let's see. So as I mentioned, the data scientist usually sits 20 miles down the pipeline from the original source of the data. Um, so there's no visibility into what the data uh, is. Um, if say a data change happens. Uh, the data scientists one would not know about that uh, just because they're um, they're so far removed and also they might be working on an old batch of data for uh, you know prototyping their service downstream. So any new data that's coming in uh, may not be uh, looked at as the data has scientists is building their service. Um, so any new change, any new schema uh, change to your data table, say, uh, needs to be communicated to the data scientists. Um, so that's one pain point uh, that uh, other stakeholders might not realize. Uh, the other pain point is the ease of getting data. Um, sometimes a data scientist might need to gather additional data to optimize their services. Um, say um, you, you're working on, uh, say, meme shirts again, right? So you want to reduce the surplus uh, globally. And now you're wondering what the cause is. And it'll be very nice for you to know the location of these warehouses and also know how much the warehouses charge for storing these t-shirts. And that information was not available to you at the beginning because you're just looking at the numbers of t-shirts being stored at these warehouses. And it just so happened that um, you know operations teams keep track of these cost numbers. Um, so it'd be nice for you to leverage that data for your services, right? So now you can have a better optimization uh, process for calculating costs over time. And uh, you as a data scientist, sometimes you you would like to get the data, uh, but you don't really know the description for those data tables containing the data. And as a result, you have to spend days, if not weeks, to talk to uh, the data table owners about uh, these data. And sometimes, these efforts will lead to dead ends, as um, you might find out that, oh, this data table is very stale. It has not been updated for two months. Or uh, the data table is being generated automatically, and the owner of the table, had, had they have left the company uh, without documenting the table uh, very well. So it'll be nice to have a central location to um, to store the information about data tables. And this is actually a very uh, crucial step for companies to eventually become data savvy. Um, and, and that's to ensure that you have a very good data process in place in addition to data monitoring. And I think these are the two 
um, main things that uh, others might not know about uh, that data scientists have to deal with days in and days out. Excellent. Thanks, Henry. Um, another question is related. I think you uh, you covered this a little bit, but maybe you could in your case study, um, but maybe you could just um, talk about it in a general sense. Um, what is the first step that you take as a data scientist when a problem arises? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. So, uh, so in the example, we kind of covered this, but it was not uh, said explicitly. Uh, so the first step you will take, uh, or you should take, is to get data. Um, because without data, you're not really uh, touching the problem, right? So, so you need to get in there and and know what's going on by gathering data. So, um, so the first step is to ask: Is the is the data fresh, right? So, so all of the uh, and then all of the uh, the EDA steps that we have discussed. So, asking: Is the data fresh? Uh, what are the values um, from the EDA um, exercise? And and I think these are basically the, the most crucial things uh, you could do as a data scientist uh, first. And once you have something, then you want to communicate that to uh, teams. Um, but I want to also say that if you see a problem, uh, like, like the example that we have given here, if the, the problem is severe enough and you're the first to list the problem, you should definitely communicate that because um, you might be the first one in the office that day and you don't want other uh, stakeholders to be doing the same kinds of exploration to find the same problem. Uh, you want to alert them right away. Uh, but anyways, as a data scientist, your job is to make sure that uh, all of the data is moving um, into your service correctly when a problem arises. Excellent, awesome. Uh, so. Oh, actually, we have one more question that just came in. Oh, this is about uh, higher education students. Maybe this is uh, interesting to you, Henry, since you have some experience there. Um, mm. Can AI or ML uh, be a future option for higher education students? Uh, I'm not sure if that means for career or uh, for learning, but I guess what are your what are your thoughts on AI and ML for higher education students if they're in school now? Okay, so I, yeah, this is uh, a good question. I, I'm hoping that I'm interpret, interpreting this correctly. Um, so I have seen um, developments of statistics uh, throughout the years. Um, I started learning statistics when I was in high school, and I just fell in love with it. And that's because I saw uh, the tools from statistics are uh, pervasive in many different fields and many uh, fields like e uh, economics, um, marketing, uh, computer science have leveraged uh, these tools uh, to, to get to the next level. Um, and a lot of the really interesting things in our lives um, have been helped by statistics. And in this current form, AI and ML, uh, I will say yes, definitely. A lot of different fields uh, for, you know, we're studying such as arts, um, such as, uh, you know, something like even um, physical education, right? How do you make sure that the programs that your students are in will make sure that they are going to be physically fit uh, for life? That um, that could be helped by AI or ML. Um, so I think um, I think you're pretty much, I think, in agreement here if you're asking this question. Uh, I think everyone should have the option to, to learn about AI and ML. Um, I think as a community um, of statisticians, machine learning engineers, um, we have put out a lot of really great resources online uh, for students who access to be able to learn. And there are some really awesome videos on YouTube 
uh, that anyone could check out at any time, anywhere in the world. And um, I think uh, that might be the first step for students to learn uh, is to really imagine what could be done in their current field of study. Um, what could be done better? What could be automated? So they can uh, then spend their headspace elsewhere, maybe advance the field in other ways so they don't have to be bogged down by all the mundane stuff. Kind of like you know the data quality field here that we have been discussing. Uh, the manual work is uh, really boring, but they have to be done. So let's use AI and ML uh, and do a good job at applying them to, to solving these very manual problems. So then we can focus on our business. And I hope I answered that question. Uh, if I haven't uh, answered your question very well, please uh, reach out to us and we may be able to help you and your students. Uh, that's a great segue, I think. Um, so if you'd like to get in touch with Henry, if you have any more questions about um, exploratory data analysis or uh, data science, um, you can reach Henry, he, find him on LinkedIn or reach him at henry at uh, bigeye.com. Also, if you go to bigeye.com, you can subscribe to our newsletter. You'll find out about all the, the blogs that we're writing um, and any future presentations that we're putting together. So Henry, thank you for the excellent presentation and thank you everybody who attended today. All right, goodbye. Thank you. Bye.